Mary, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, once, upon a, once upon a time, maybe it was uh, 15 or 18 years ago, I went down to the nut and bolt supply shop, Bolt Masters, I think it was called. What I was looking for was a really big bolt with two nuts that were the same size, but I wanted the nuts, one to have a thread that fitted the thread on the bolt and one with a different thread. And um, I thought maybe there were three or four different threads you could buy. I remembered, you know, Whitworth and, and SAE and, you know, British Standard. I could remember a few. When I get to the store, they said, oh, no, there's, there's 53 or 55, you know, different kinds of, of thread. These engineers, you know, thread for everything. What I had in mind to do was to play a little trick on someone in the church on the following Sunday to illustrate something I needed to teach. And of course, there was one fellow there and he was one of the leaders of the church, but he was also enthusiastic, zealous, you know, and with all of that, easily misled. <laughs> and so I'd, I, you know, I, I have these two nuts, but nobody knows I've got two nuts. <laughs> and the one that fits and one that doesn't, you know, and they both look the same. And I'm looking for a volunteer, you know, and he's always going to be the first. You know? <laughs> oh, no, come on up, you know. And I'm saying, um, I gave the lesson and I said, look, to demonstrate, you know, so I, give, I give Noel the nut that doesn't fit. He doesn't know that. He's supposed to put the nut on the bolt. And, he, and, he, and I'm saying, oh, no, come on, Noel. It's easy. Give it here. And without him realising, I switched the nuts. <laughs> and put it on. And, there you go. Look at that. No, pulled it off again. Now you try. And I give him the other nut. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. Now, I'm going to tell you what the lesson was in a minute. <laughs> But um, a more serious story, we went through a period in about 20 years ago where there was a big activity of lying spirits in the church. And, and it was quite extreme, actually. And, and you have people leaving the church for no reason. You have really good people been with you for years and they'd say, oh, there's no reason for leaving. I, I just feel it's time for a change. Some lying spirit. And it got so bad that in one house group, you know, one of the pastors was sharing something and there was a lady there that accused him of saying something he didn't say. But the lady next to her said he did. Some lion spirit between the two of them. And this, was, this stuff was going on and we've been praying about it, you know, binding things, rebuking things, cutting stuff off, repenting of things, dealing with reproaches, you know, all the stuff you know to do and more and couldn't break it. But one Tuesday afternoon, I'm in a meeting with the pastors and their wives and we're praying. And all of a sudden I heard the Lord tell me what to pray. It's a handy one to remember this. He said, pray that the Holy Spirit will be the spirit of truth in the hearing of the people. I prayed that one prayer. Right then at the table, I said that one time and that whole thing finished. Now go figure, you know, like some of these things don't make a lot of sense. But all, you, you know, we were fairly experienced in dealing with spiritual warfare issues and you think if it's demonic activity, a spiritual warfare kind of prayer was required but actually needed a different kind of prayer. And it really doesn't hurt to pray that prayer regularly over congregations but over cities, over nations, over the media. Pray that the Holy Spirit would be the spirit of truth. It's a funny kind of a phrase. Pray that the Holy Spirit would be the spirit of truth in the hearing of the people. Now, the reason I mention it is because I've picked up just chatting with folks around the place and not with most, but here and there, there's a little confusion over how could you be uh, of one heart with people where you don't have the same doctrine? Or how can you 
forgive people a deeper level of mercy where they're still not trustworthy people. It's that kind of thing. And, you know, different conversations I've had and it makes me realise something is hindering the ability of some people to believe and walk in freely the things the Scriptures have to tell us about the body of Christ. And in the middle of the night, I came to realise that that I think probably on the city as a whole is what I would call a spirit of obfuscation. Obfuscation. You know, it, it hinders, it blocks, it clouds, it confuses. Obfuscates the work of the Spirit. So I'm going to pray and um, I'm going to ask the, ask the Holy Spirit to be the Spirit of Truth. In our hearing, I'm going to release it over the city and give that spirit of obfuscation a rebuke, cast it off the body of Christ, because the Lord's got plans for this city. This city is Christ church, but there's a spirit obfuscating the oneness of the city, the oneness of the body. You can't have a whole city if you don't have a whole body. The health of the body of Christ determines the health of the city. Father, Hear our prayer today. Grant that the Holy Spirit would be the spirit of truth in the hearing of everyone here today. And over this city, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I rebuke every spirit that resists the body of Christ and clouds judgment, clouds hearing, clouds vision, clouds revelation. I cut off the obfuscation. I cut off the confusion and cast it off the body of Christ, command the spirits flee. I break the power of that curse in Jesus' name and I release over this city the love of God the Father. I release over the city the spirit of understanding. I I release into Christ church the anointing by which community is built. I release it in Jesus' name and floods over the body of Christ. Holy Spirit, be the spirit of truth in this city. Be the spirit of truth in the government. Be the spirit of truth in the media. Be the spirit of truth in churches. Be the spirit of truth in schools and in homes and businesses, in commerce, in industry, in education. Lord, be the spirit of truth all through this city and in our own hearts. Thank you for the mind of the Lord. Let it be fully established in your people across this city. May this become a city of such love the fullness, Lord, of your love at work in this city. May the believers come to admire each other, to love one another deeply from the heart, to one another above, one another above themselves, to receive each other, to accept each other, to do the things the Scripture says, but with the ability to see and to understand why. That is to walk in grace, Lord, I release this grace today over this congregation and over all of this city in uh, Jesus' name. When we think something different that we believe emphatically, but it's different to what the Bible says, we are in unbelief. Unbelief is not your failure to believe something. It's believing something different to what the Lord thinks. So when the Lord says, love one another, be of one heart, one mind with each other, but we can't see how that's possible and we carry the doubt, we are in unbelief. But when we have an attitude that says, well, no, they're like that, so I can't be one with them, we are in unbelief. All the while we think we're standing for the faith. We've been deceived. So unbelief in us is often a positive, we think it's positive. We're believing something. You know, we think it's principled but it's often unbelief. We're not thinking the way the Lord thinks, not believing what he says to believe. So we're going to address that a little bit today. Uh, Jesus said the truth, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Um, the, The work of the Spirit in church life is not only uh, releasing of anointings and power to heal and deliverance and, you know, moving in the Spirit, so to speak. It's also 
the, the clear impartation of the Word of God, of understanding. In fact, without the Word of God, we easily go amuck. You need both. It's always been Word and Spirit together or you don't have the fullness of the Spirit. Without Word and Spirit together, you don't actually have the life of the Spirit properly. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are Spirit. And so that's kind of more the grace. I, I mean, I don't, I don't lack for words of knowledge. I don't lack for hearing God. I hear God. Uh, I, you know, have often over the years solved problems for people. But the, the strength for me is, is understanding the meaning of things and explaining it. And very often it's just knowing the truth that makes a huge difference. I've known people who were sick and who had demons running around their house and uh, having other effects that were demonic that came from nothing other than what they were thinking. It wasn't caused by something projected against them at all. And when they changed their thinking, the demons immediately left. Very often it's that way. Well, what you believe very important. Um, I, I've got to move on here. Um, the, um, we were doing a conference. We were to do a conference on the Gold Coast 15 or 20 years ago, Gold Coast in Australia. And more than any other conference, I'd done lots of them over the years. These were apostolic conferences. More than, anyone, more than any other, I felt we should pray for this one. And so we had special prayer meetings at the church. And this night, Monday night, we're a week out from the conference. And the Lord told me something. I heard the Lord say something I'd never heard him say before. He said that the state of the church on the Gold Coast was that it was a disparate people. Disparate. Now, now don't uh, accents... I, I'm not saying desperate with a D-E-S at the front, but it's desperate, D-I-S in the front of this word. And I thought I knew what that meant. Uh, but, you know, I thought it meant, well, you know, separated and scattered. The people, the Christian believers were separated from one another and a bit scattered. But very often, I mean always, whenever the Lord gives me an unusual word, a word we don't use much, and we might even think we know the meaning... I have discovered if, and the Lord intends this, if I go look up the dictionary, there'll be a very specific meaning that he's wanting me to find and know ab about the thing. And so it was in this case, I discovered the word disparate had a larger meaning than what I assumed. I assumed it meant to be separated and, 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 and scattered, but it meant more. To be in a disparate state is not only to be separated but that the pieces cannot be joined together because they are of a different kind. And the Lord was saying this about the church on the Gold Coast, but I realised it was true everywhere. But you think, how could this be possible? How could it be possible that the body of Christ, when we know the Bible truth is that the body is one, there's one church, one church in eternity, one church on earth. There's one God and Father, one Holy Spirit, one Bible, one gospel, one salvation, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. When there is so much oneness, how is it that all these people across cities who believe the same Bible, have the same Holy Spirit, pray the same prayers, are given the same promises by the Lord. He promises you revival and he's handing out that same, very often the same Bible verse to half a dozen other churches in town. How is it that when you have the same salvation, the same baptism of the Holy Spirit, the same doctrines, you believe in God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, you you believe the Bible's the authoritative word, and so on and so forth. You believe in the resurrection. How is it that you cannot join the pieces together? How could, how could a people who are one be disparate? In what sense could that possibly be true? In what sense can it possibly be true that pieces that belong to each other cannot be joined? Cannot be joined. That's what the Lord said. Well, something has to change. 
But this is why I went out and bought a bolt and two nuts. Because one could be joined and the other one couldn't. Poor old Noel had the one that couldn't. And I had the one that could. And the reason that one could not be fitted was because the thread was it was the, the thread cut in the thing was different. It just wouldn't screw on. But it looked the same. How does it work? Here's what it is. It's not that the Christian doctrines are not mostly identical. Do you know, except for minor matters, mostly just matters that the Bible says you're allowed to have a difference of opinion on, the doctrines across the body are near identical. So the difference is not what we believe about God. It's not what we believe about the Bible. It's not what we believe about prayer. It's not what we believe about the promises. The difference is not in the hymns we sing. The big differences are not with respect to what we believe about God or Jesus. The difference is what we believe about ourselves. Because we think we're pretty good. And we think they're not so good. We think we're A class and they're B class. We think we have better church, better better worship, better prayer, better faith. This is the real thing. And we think we, we we don't like their way of doing things so much. So we have high views of ourselves and lesser views to some degree of all these others. And that is the reason so much of the body of Christ is in a disparate state and cannot be joined. If I think I'm A class and you're B, but you think you're A class and I'm B, you cannot join our hearts together. But the scripture says, honour one another above yourself. You should start thinking they're A class and you're B and it would be a great honour to love them and be loved by them. To overcome the disparate state starts right here. What we believe about ourselves, our church, our work, our calling, our vision, our promises, We think it sets us apart. But the truth is that across the city, there is only one body and you are members of it. Our attitudes to the body affect our own health. We think we are achieving a lot, but actually it's not that much compared to what could be achieved if the love of the believers across the city, especially the love of the leaders for each other, went to another place, then the church would have great power. The church is limited in its power, limited in its revelation because of its disparate state. No church, no congregation, no leader, no outfit of any kind has all the gifts, all the abilities, all the anointings, all the power, all the revelation. You have, we have, even Paul said, we know in part, we prophesy in part. And it will stay that way until we, we find wholeness come to the body of Christ. Now, what it means is if you struggle to see how you can walk in fellowship with someone who has slightly different beliefs, principles, practices to you, if you struggle with that, you're struggling to believe the word of God that says you're one and meant to love each other. Now, admittedly, admittedly, um, there are some things we, we take issue over. You know, if there was a group in town that had a wrong doctrine of Christ, we're not receiving that. If there were a bunch of Gnostics in town, we wouldn't be receiving them. You know, we don't look to have fellowship with the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons 
and the like. There are certain things that that mean you're either Christian or you're not. But if you're Christian, we're meant to build bridges, reach out in love, develop relationship. The trouble in the past is pastors and others have assumed that you've got to think the same and have exactly the same practices and, you know, sort out doctrinal differences or you can't have fellowship. That's an error. You, you can't win this battle by winning an argument. You win the battle by winning hearts. We have to love because they need to come to the place where they get to know us. And if they will get to know us and we will get to know them, what you'll find is you start to like them. You start to honour them. You start to realise there's goodness in them. You start to realise the Lord's working amongst them. And so you start to love them and you'll come into a genuine love that leads you to trust them. And it's amazing where this goes. And we've had quite a measure of success with this in our own city, but it's taken time. And I've been there working at this since 1989 with a few false starts, but try again. And finally, something is happening in the city that's astounding. And yet it's not as if along the way we didn't do a lot of good. And yes, there were always a few pastors in the city who were untrustworthy because they were thieves. Pray people out of other churches into theirs, make arrogant claims. Their prayers weren't holy prayers. Their prayers were unclean prayers and motivated demons. Yes, there's a certain amount of that can happen. So you've got to know how to deal with that, how to bind the spirits, how to cut off false claims. Because this is the problem. When a church is a disparate people, a lot of claims go out from their prayers that are fleshly. And this was the case of the Gold Coast, but it's the case pretty much everywhere else. And what happens is this. Somebody comes to town, there might already be 10, 20, 30, 40, 100 churches. There are men and women who have been sent into that city by the Lord to work for the city and to love the body and to build up the body long before this new fellow ever came along. But he doesn't give a fig about anybody who's already there. No, he's got the call. He's here to plant a church. And he's going to be more successful than all the others. No, he's going to really make a difference now. And it's all sheer arrogance. And, and blindness. Why not respect the fact that even if I don't know who they are yet, there are people in this city who love Christ, who are sold out to Christ and the Lord put them there before me and it's only together we might get the breakthrough. I was aware in Rockhampton that there were several churches. The Lord had given us promises about revival out of the scriptures. And here we had them and we're in prayer meetings and praying and believing God. Then they discovered some other churches had the same promises. Now, if there were three churches in the city had the same promises, do you think the Lord's talking about three different revivals? And why do you think we haven't had the revival yet? It might be because we didn't get our heads and our hearts together. the steps and stages toward this. And so what I, what I discovered in all of this was that, because um, this was our thing in those special prayer meetings we had leading up to this conference on the Gold Coast, there were those of us who had visions and it was of gridlock. You, you look at, it, it's like you have a vision of, the, of traffic snarled in the city, you know, just total gridlock, nobody going anywhere. But this was the spiritual state of the city. What was causing this spiritual gridlock? Lots of Christians, lots of prayers, lots of churches, but nobody going anywhere. Locked up. It turns out it was locked up by everybody making claims over the city. So say the new fellow comes along and He's going to plant a church and he's got a few people with him and they see themselves as intercessors and maybe prophetic intercessors if they want to give themselves an extra stripe, you know. And um, 
So they're out now walking the streets and praying. You know, we, we claim this city for Jesus. But actually in their hearts, they're claiming it for their, church, their, their new church. They're claiming it for themselves. So what they're, 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 they're saying it's for Jesus, but it's a fleshly claim. And what I've learned is that what goes out is not the literal meaning of what you say. You say, I claim the city for Jesus, but what goes out is not the meaning of the words. What goes out is actually what's in the heart. And it's a lust for your own progress, but nobody else's. So it's fleshly and it soon empowers demons. This is a case of Christians who have Christian authority lending their authority to devils that then resist the church because if, if this fellow is claiming the city, then when other Christians pray, the position of demons is, no, you can't have it, they've claimed it. And then the position of demons over here is, no, you can't have it, they've claimed it. And you get total spiritual gridlock. Everybody's words, laying claims, and it's like a big tug of war where instead of one rope and two teams, you've got 100 ropes and 200 teams, and they're all pulling on this centre point. And I had a problem with this in our city. If you read my, the City Gate book, uh, we, we brought a few. In fact, we sold a bunch of those last time I was here and a few more this time. That book is full of stories. It's full of horror stories like, like this. And uh, every one of those stories took place in our city. Uh, the book doesn't say that. And almost every one of those stories was caused by one pastor out of order. And uh, there was an extreme case, I know, but he was, he thought like a businessman. He was never called to be a pastor. And he didn't think like a pastor. He thought like a businessman who wanted to drive everybody out of business and have a monopoly. And his attitude was, if my church is better than yours, then your people should be in my church. He was one driven guy. And when he turned up, you talk about the prayers you pray people by name out of your church into his. I mean, this was very extreme stuff, but it, it, it demonstrates what I'm talking about where most of it's not so extreme. He was a control merchant, a claims merchant. Lloyd, who was with me the last few days, because he was, as I was, just living by trusting the Lord to supply means, and he and Jenny had done very well for three years. I mean, their, their, their needs were met and he was travelling and... But all of a sudden it dried up and they went through two years where finance was really tight. You know, you get by, but just kind of thing. And then suddenly they realised one night they were living under the shadow of where that fellow had his office and his church and was laying these claims in the city. They realised they'd come under the power of his claims. So they prayed and cut off his claims and their finance freed up. So... Um, I'm just trying to demonstrate claims. Well, I was driving along because I had a major problem with it. This fellow in the city was so jealous of us, jealous of everything we had and, and lying these strong claims. It was so demonic. It was the most demonic thing I'd faced in the city. And so I'm driving this day from Rockhampton to Narborough. It's a 10-hour drive. And all along, I'm at the wheel, but I'm pondering, how do you deal with this when you've got this guy so, so strong every day driven prayers, jealous prayers, you know, <clears throat> uh, demonic activity. How do we defeat it? Two hours I'm pondering this at the wheel and the Lord says, relinquish all your own claims. Oh, yeah, it's like let go of the tug of war. You know what happens to the other team when you let the rope, <laughs> without telling them, suddenly let the rope go, splat. <laughs> And that's when I realised, yeah, this is, what, this is what we all have to do. But I looked into it further and I don't have the information in front of me now, but what I realised was that claims in prayers 
are not actually a biblical way to pray. There are five or six other ways to pray far more biblical than just saying, I claim this. And uh, somewhere I have a message on that. It's probably in the app, but it's... um, I, I, I just make a general statement now. Claims can be very dangerous. You're laying claims on this, laying claims on that. No, you must find ways of believing God. Lord, I believe. The Lord answers prayers. He gives promises. There are scriptures. There are lots of ways to stand in faith without your claim being a fleshly one. Um, anyway, I, we won that battle. And we, uh, it did not harm our church, but it, there was another church in town it totally ripped the guts out of that church. It collapsed. The pastor got sick. He had to retire out of the ministry. And I went to him to help him. But every time he didn't believe in spiritual warfare and every time I raised the subject, he just changed the subject. Couldn't help him. And um, anyway, so look, back back on our main subject. We, You do have some differences. Look, Forget the extreme differences of people you that really aren't Christian or their faith is bizarre and you're not going to make it part of the group. And there, there are certain things you do exclude, it's like divisive. The Bible's very clear. Uh, warn a divisive brother or sister. Warn them a second time. After that, have nothing more to do with it. There are certain things that, it's, that leadership must exercise judgment and discipline concerning in the body. Absolutely. There's a place for proper discretion, proper discernment, discipline. The body does need discipline. And this is why you need the Holy Spirit to really understand the difference between a a heart judgment that is a sin and is polluting you as against the wisdom of discretion and discernment that you need in making choices and decisions. The word judgment in Scripture is applied to both of these things and so... If you don't understand it, like if you feel strong in one but confused in the other, you've got to get on your knees. You've got to take the scriptures before the Lord and say, Lord, just like I did with healing years ago, you know, I, I, how, would, how would you get into real faith over something? No, I went to my knees. And, and presently, you know, the glory will come upon you and you become wise in that thing. Oh, sudden you can see and understand. And that's what has to happen with your need to to see the body as one, love the body, work for the healing of the body because ultimately you're working for the healing of the city and not not just stay out of that and remain in, you know, judgment and critical assessment and and assumptions about other people. Well, it turns out that, look, quite apart from things that are, are, are principles with us, You know, if people reject the idea of the Holy Trinity, if they think, well, Jesus was a good man but not the Son of God, we're not going to buy into that. We're not letting that kind of thing in our prayer meetings. That's that's not essentially the body of Christ. But we're we're not talking about the minority. We're talking about the majority. We must knit the hearts of the body of Christ together. And so one of the principles we have to accept is we're here to win hearts not agreement with our ideas. And to help you with this, to help you accept that this is true, you need to understand that even in the Christian life and even in the Bible truth, there is such a thing as matters over which you're entitled, you're you're allowed to disagree. And Paul called them disputable matters. And uh, I'm going to read you the scripture. Um, This is Romans 14. In fact, the whole chapter and a bit of the next is is worth reading just slowly and thoughtfully two or three times over. But here's verse, just, just the first three verses of Romans 14. Here's the first verse. Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. I told you it was in the Bible. In other words, there are disputable matters and you might have the more accurate position 
and they are less accurate position, but you're not in a rush to sort that out. Rather, you have to learn to love each other and walk together. And a lot of that stuff, interestingly, clears up along the way. <coughs> One man's faith allows him to eat anything, uh, everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does. For God has accepted him. So this just raises the issue of disputable matters. Now, we, we, we don't have the time, but could I say that numbers of things easily fall into this category that the Bible actually talks about. That's, and this, in this case, food is the issue here. And um, drink comes up in the passage and in other places. And uh, holy day, the question of holy days, you know, some people think, no, come Sunday, you don't even polish your shoes, no work, you know. Other people are totally relaxed. You can go to church and then go to the beach, kind of, you know, like who can say who's right or wrong? And, and what you're needing is for the Holy Spirit to put it in the heart of how he wants people to live. But the Holy Spirit can't do it and won't do it if, we're, if we've got rigid views and, and rigid rules. We get far better results when we give freedom but teach, you know, the, the principles of walking with the Lord and listening to him. Baptism and communion also, the, the thing here is, it's not that there shouldn't be baptism and communion and yet you've got some churches, perfectly acceptable Christian denominations who have done great work, like the Salvation Army is one of those, who don't even practice either baptism or communion. Yet they have brought millions and millions to Christ and historically lived the most exemplary Christian lives and possibly more than any other movement up to their time believed in the baptism of the Spirit and had the power of the Spirit fall on them. Smith Wigglesworth said the Salvation Army in those days had huge power. They laid aside all emphasis on communion because they were bringing so many alcoholics and drunkards to the Lord. They laid aside baptism because there was so much controversy about the subject in the church of their day and they stepped away. They didn't want to participate in that. There were historic reasons for it. So you'd have to say, well, that's pretty disputable. <laughs> but, but no, you, they've made a huge contribution to the body. And, but then the funny thing about communion is the Lord is present but nobody can really explain how he's present. So the Catholics got one view and the Lutherans another. The Catholics call it transubstantiation and the Lutherans call it consubstantiation. We don't believe either one. <laughs> and we have our, everyone has their own kind of version of what the table of the Lord means and, and how is the Lord present and is he simply present or is he present in the bread and the wine or the Catholic view is that the bread actually becomes Jesus, you know, like, just allow it to be a disputable matter. It's not going to divide us. Just enjoy the thing. Drink the power. And the same with the baptism. Like we have all these pastors come to our meeting now in Rockhampton. They all pray together. It's wonderful. Most of them started praying and sounding very denominational. You know, just weak little prayers. Lord, if it, by your, if it be your will, you know, bless the saints this week. Kind of, not much more than that. Today, they're all praying like highly experienced, you know, charismatics, Pentecostals, word of faith people, Salvation Army revivalists. No, all around the room now. And such faith is present. City being transformed. It's astounding. And in that group, we have Catholic and Lutheran, Anglican, Uniting Church, the police chaplain, Pentecostal people, faith people, Baptists and people who are none of the any of the others like us. And yet we are all things to all men. Our attitude is to the Anglicans, we're Anglican. To the Pentecostals, we're Pentecostal. 
And in that group, we've got Korean, African, Indian, Islander, uh, Australian of all stripes. Um, maybe some others. And they love each other deeply these days. But it wasn't like that before. It's taken time. And with it, they've changed. But they only changed by being fully accepted, loved, and we did not push up our differences. You know, we don't even mention the word apostle in that group. I don't even give anyone my books in that group. We're letting the Spirit of the Lord bring about. And, of course, this has huge influence. It goes beyond the city. Well, why is all this? Uh, some things are not disputable, which is why you need wise, mature leaders. Immoralities. Um, that's not a disputable matter. That's got to be an absolute and idolatries and false gospels and false Christs. Anyway, moving on. Uh, not much time left, so let me, let me get to this. I, I've mentioned already... Oh, well, oh, let me read you this. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10 to 13. This is the basic position of Scripture when, when cities or churches are, are not as one. Paul writes, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. This is what it's meant to be. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarrelling among you, my brothers. Now, they're quarrelling with each other, but Paul refers to all sides as my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. That's the high ground there. So, oh, I follow Christ. <laughs> no, no, I'm not, I'm not Lutheran. You know, I'm not Calvinist. I'm not Pentecostal. I'm Church of Christ, you know. <laughs> Church of the Nazarene, you know. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, yes. But Paul says, is Christ divided? Now, you, you haven't got to go beyond those three words to say, hang on. There's something wrong here. Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptised in the name of Paul? Anyway, he's arguing. He, he, look, it's, it's a matter of correct belief system. Because if we live according to a correct belief system, it ultimately brings about changes in our behaviour. Certainly about our assumptions. It's our, it's our assumptions that must change. Our subconscious presumption that must change. And I mentioned already on Sunday and maybe last night about that judgement the Scriptures speak of. That when we, when we receive the bread and the cup, but we have attitudes to the body of Christ, in other words, we're failing to discern the Lord's body, failing to respect the Lord's body, failing to honour the Lord's body, we carry an attitude, uh, we are at risk of eating and drinking judgment to ourselves. This is why many of you are sick, Paul said, why many of you are weak. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. So whenever I, maybe I said this Sunday, every, once I learned this years ago, I developed a practice for myself and recommended for others Every Sunday, wherever I am, usually at home, to receiving communion, before I put that bread in my mouth, I've got prayers to pray. Now, the traditional thing, especially if you're a Baptist, was this was you, before you ate that bread, you had to confess any sin and every sin. But now I say to people, no, it's not any sin. It's not every sin. It's one particular sin. Let a man examine himself. The women better too. Uh, before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup, because anyone who eats and drinks without, you know, drinks judgment. Now, it's one particular sin. The passage tells us what the sin is, failing to recognise the body of Christ. 
And the whole First Corinthian book is about it. Because you know, that's 1 Corinthians 11. I talked about this the other day. You know, as soon as you get through that, you get to chapter 12 where it talks about the body is one. We're members of one another. That's where the gifts of the Spirit come up. But you know, as soon as you get through that bit, and guess what's next? The love chapter. The greatest of these is love. You can speak with tongues, but if you haven't got love, won't do you any good. Give your body to be burned, won't do you any good. The greatest of these is love. And so that's that, that's that whole epistle. So here's my prayer. Knowing that there's one sin... We, I've got to, we must stay free from. And that's sin against the body, sin against the body of Christ. So my prayer, while I'm still holding that bread, and uh, I'll often break it again. You know, just think about Christ's body broken. But I'll say, Lord, if I have committed any sin against the body, for, you know, I ask your forgiveness, cleanse me, any sin against my wife, any sin against anyone here present, anyone any sin against the city, any sin against the body across the world, cleanse me. I, and then I will pray the positive side of the prayer. I will say, Lord, make me one with the body of Christ. I've prayed that prayer now for years. And I've started recently to add another and say, Lord, make the body of Christ one with me. The wholeness of the body. And then I'll eat the bread. Because when you eat the bread, the moment you put that thing on your tongue, you start chewing that, you swallow it, you know you're making a proclamation. That proclamation is going out before angels, going out before devils. You're making it before men and devils. You're making it before heaven. You're making it before God the Holy Spirit and before Christ. By taking the bread, you are making a proclamation which says... I am one with the body of Christ. So that's why it'd be just as well to pray the prayer before you pop the bread. <laughs> Lord, forgive me if I've sinned and make me one. And sooner or later, there'll be a mighty outworking of that prayer because see, you've, you've basically humbled yourself. You've, you may be full of fault, but at least you've humbled yourself before the Lord. And... Um, it will do you good. All right, look, I've got a few minutes and I've got to quit. Um, I was hoping to have had enough time left to show you some things in Ephesians chapter 4. I'll show you a few. Um, <clears throat> if we go there anyway, Ephesians 4, look, most of, you, uh, most of you are familiar with bits of it and pretty much all of you will have heard preaching over the years on, uh, quite often on one or two verses in this passage. Like everybody knows, you know, he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. You've all heard that part over and over. But uh, let's just look a bit more closely at the first few verses of the chapter. By the way, the, the whole context of the chapter, and it comes out in the chapter, is... Christ ascends, he, in ascending, he conquers principalities and powers and completely rearranges the heavens, although leaves a lot of it yet for us to mop up and deal with. But in ascending to the Father's right hand and now ruling the kingdom from heaven, he gives grace to the church. He actually says he gives gifts to men. He gives some, this is where it says, then some apostles. Why? Because we need them. Some prophets, some pastors, some teachers, evangelists. He gives these gifts. They're grace gifts. Tells us why he gives them. To equip the body, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry because we're all in the ministry. We're all priests. And then it tells us for how long this will continue. I'll come to that in a moment. If we go back though to verse 1, Paul says, I, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. He's about to tell us what this worthy manner is. Verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, 
Now, this humility and gentleness has to be expressed to other Christians. With patience, you can be very patient with them, just thinking differently than we do. We might have more, we might think we have more than them. They might be born again, but we've got the Holy Spirit kind of attitude. It doesn't help you. Well, it helps you, of course, live for yourself, but it won't help you heal the body. Because this is, again, this is A class thinking. And they're B class. No, you, you honor them above yourselves. Your desire is to love and serve and honor. So, with patience, bearing with one another in love. And it brings us to verse 3 eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, the unity of the Spirit is a unity that can be achieved and maintained even if you have differences in all these disputable matters. Try and remember the phrase, the unity of the Spirit, because in 10 verses we're going to come to another unity. But meanwhile, stick here. Verse 4. Now, here is basic Christian doctrine. You must settle it in your heart forever and cling to it as a truth. There is one body, this is in the whole world, one body of Christ and one Spirit. Just as you were called to one hope that belongs to our call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all who's over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. We're going to jump to verse 11. Let's remember, one body, one spirit, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one God, one church. Verse 11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until, here's the good bit. It's, it's not exactly a prophecy, but it is a forecast. It's a bit more reliable than weather forecasting and financial forecasting. You know, they say financial forecasting was invented to make weather forecasting look good. But this is Paul giving the... The, his forth, forth telling of the future. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith, there's the unity of the faith. Maintain the unity of the Spirit. Strive for it. Love the brethren. One faith, one hope, one baptism, until we all come to the unity of the faith. And this is why we have apostles and the rest to bring us to this Without being brought to this, friends, we are going nowhere. Let me tell you, this until, this until is a weighty word. Until. What, what's the until? Christ remains at the right hand of the Father until. Christ continues the rule, the kingdom of heaven, from heaven, on earth, until. No second coming. Until. Until we all come to the unity of the faith. All, all's a big word. And we're not assuming that every last person in the lunatic fringe around the church quite makes it in, but we're, we're talking <laughs> big picture. You know, church as a whole in the world. The church as a whole in the world. Look, when I started, when, the, when this apostolic call came to me and I started to get revelation, we were very clear about one thing. We are here to see the reformation of the whole church in the whole world. Until we all come. Now, take this as a prophecy. The apostle is speaking. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. That's another unity. Unity of the faith, unity of the knowledge of the Son of God. Same thing. To mature manhood, it's the same thing using a different phrase, to maturities. This is spiritual maturity. And then he calls it something else, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He calls it four things. But it's a state of grace. When the Lord plucked you out of the world and converted you and you were born again, he brought you from a place where you were powerless and he put you in a state of grace. 
In other words, it, give, it gave you freedoms and abilities and powers you never had before and didn't come from you, came from him, but now it's yours. And when you got baptized in the Holy Spirit, he took you from that and he put you in an even better state of grace and gave you powers you never had before. And it turns out there are more states of grace. And he is, Paul is here describing a state of grace that is meant to come upon the church. You get born again individually. You might have got baptized in the Holy Spirit individually, although on day one it wasn't. It was a corporate baptism of the Spirit. They all got it at once when the Holy Spirit was poured out. But here he is describing a state of grace that the whole church is to come into. And yes, it's possible to step into it individually. It's possible for whole congregations at once to come into this state of grace. It's possible for cities to come into it. We're going to see more of this. Until we all attain, oh, oh, what is the measure? He, he, he calls it four things, but one of the things he calls it is the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. It's a mouthful. What is the measure? Here's the stature of Christ. Well, the, here's the fullness of Christ, the stature of the fullness of Christ, and what's the measure of it? How do you measure? What's Christ's measure? What's, what's Christ's measure that you're meant to measure up to? He's told us. He said, as I have loved you, so you also love one another. This is the measure of this until we all come. To this, the fullness of love. So dear friends, we just finished the reading. Mostly preachers quit there because the time for their sermon's up as mine is right now. (laughs) And, And you hardly ever get a preaching on the rest of the paragraph. It's one paragraph and we're only halfway through the paragraph. So we might as well read the paragraph So that, the the interesting thing about this is that's not the end of the road. It's going to take us time to get there, but in a sense, it's only the beginning of Christian history on earth. That's where the, the church really comes into gospel power and starts to really transform nations. Because we have here now a so that. We had an until and now a so that. There's outcomes. I better read it and quit. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. See, it's the clearing up of the disputable matters that you're allowed to have. Uh, Not carried away by human cunning and craftiness of deceitful shit. So no more infancy, no more instability, no more deception. Rather... Look where it goes. Speaking of the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body now, the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So there's a whole lot more of building up in love. In closing, may I say, here in this passage is mentioned the fullness of Christ that you're meant to come into the fullness of Christ and, and it is surrounded by this call to understand how to love one another and be brought into it. This is chapter 4. In chapter 3, Paul, instead of calling the same state of grace the fullness of Christ, he calls it the fullness of God. And he has given us a prayer, or well, a prayer he was praying which the first half's in chapter 1, the second half's in chapter 3. And it, it's a lengthy prayer, but it takes you through levels of revelation and understanding until you come to ever-increasing experiences of love that passes understanding. And it's, it's the love that comes out of revelation of Christ that Paul says brings you past, past that point where you, you are filled with a love that is beyond understanding and it brings you into the fullness of God. And you can't tell me that what he's describing there is a different thing to what he's describing here, and you can't tell me that it's a different thing to what Jesus was describing in John 17 when he said, Father, make them one as you and I are one, 
so that bring them to complete unity, he says, so that the world will believe. In other words, I've only given you a little, a little of what's in Scripture. There's nothing probably more important. Um, you, can't, you can't say there's anything more important in Scripture once you've found the Saviour. You know, the gospel's hugely important, but once you've got the gospel and then you've heard the second message, forgive each other, you cannot get beyond the most important next single thing is to obey the command of Christ uh, as a new commandment I give you, he says. So anyway, enough of that. We are praying that the Lord would open eyes and hearts to understand, because in other words, to get us out of unbelief into faith with respect to the transformation of this city the whole body of Christ in the city, but not in this one, wherever you come from, really, the transformation of New Zealand. Um, I pray pretty much, well, every time I pray for Australia, I pray for New Zealand. And it, uh, include the Pacific, I, I am believing the Lord for an awakening, believing the Lord for the nations to turn. And um, uh, anyway, a little prayer and I close. Father, Thank you for the Word of God, open-ended as it is, unresolved as it is, so many things left unexplained. But we thank you as the Word of God and Holy Spirit. Carry understanding to every heart, conviction to every heart. And thank you that as we learn to think as you do, we see fruitful outcomes in life. And I ask that you'd make every one of these believers fruitful in their families, in homes, in their streets, in the churches, in the city, fruitful for Christ. And again, we pray and release over the city of Christ Church, the anointing by which community is built. Lord, bring this whole, the whole body of this city to oneness and to love. May there be such a deep love and respect for each other, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.